Okay, so we're going to talk about the margin of cephalae today, and those are the sort of head shield animals. This is a group that I'm sure that you guys know about, the pachysaurs. We're also going to include, well, not in this lecture, but we will include in the future uh, the ceratopsians, which are, of course, our frilled dinosaurs, which are some of the more classic examples of dinosaurs. But these guys, I think, are also very cool. And the, the very uh, interesting thing about this, you know, this giant bump on top of the head, we're going to spend a lot of time actually talking about that today, because the ecology of these animals is, is similar to some of the ecology that we saw in the last two groups. But uh, this, this giant head dome is, is pretty unique and different in that way. So we're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time on that as opposed to some of the other stuff. So if we just go back again, I'm going to show you this every time we, we deal with a new group of dinosaurs. If you go at, to our place in, this, in the family tree right now, you'll notice that we are, again, still in the Ornithischians, of course, but we're in a very relatively diverse group of organisms. One of the things you will note here, and this is going to come up in just a second, uh, first I'll give you the characteristics of this group, but then we'll talk about where they're located, is that this group doesn't appear until sometime in the middle Jurassic, and that's going to have really important implications for this group uh, relative to where they're going to be found on the surface of the Earth. Just like all the other members of these groups, uh, they will start out as uh, bipedal. I'm not going to show you too many primitive pachysaurs because we really don't have a lot of primitive pachysaurs in the sense that we don't have this, um, uh, members that are really close to the basal groups in some cases. But we, we will get to look at the primitive members of these other frill groups of the, the uh, things like triceratops because we have really good examples of those. So pachysaurs as a group, imagine a primitive member as a bipedal animal without a big dome on its head, okay? So th that's going to be pretty similar to what the, the pachysaurs look like anyway uh, when they're younger. Uh, and, th and as a result, we are going to spend this week in, uh, on the uh, margin of cephaly, and then the next week we're going to spend um, on the ornithopods, so the, the uh, duckbill dinosaurs. And once we're really done with the duckbills, then we will actually enter into the other group of dinosaurs, which will be the sauropods. Uh, and of course the theropods. And what you can see, at least from this bias diagram, is that there's a lot of theropod diversity, and we're going to spend a lot of time biased towards the theropods, partially because we have so much information about them. Theropoda, which is the group that leads to marginocephaly, it, it includes them, and includes both the pachys and the, the ceratopsians, have uh, a couple of characteristics that are really important. One of them is that there's a significant diastem uh, diastema between the premaxillary and the maxillary teeth, and that is just that piece, remember, in the mouth that separates the, the forward biting teeth uh, from the rear grinding teeth, or in the case of these animals, the forward biting beak from the rear grinding teeth. So that is really characteristic of a, a group that is really intensely associated with chewing and mastication of food, and so these groups are going to be uh, primarily associated with herbivory and lots of it in that way, and that will include all the margin of cephaly. There are going to be relatively few maxillary teeth, uh, premaxillary teeth. Primarily the groups that we're going to deal with will have none. Uh, in general, most of them will have reduced teeth to nothing and will use a beak. But that's not true of every member, so we use this thing less than or equal to to include those other members. And there's this finger-like anterior trochanter bone uh, which comes off of the at the skull, which I'll point to. Here it is right here. You can see it, it does look like a finger. It sticks right off the back of the head. I'm not going to really worry too much about this uh, per se, other than that's characteristic of this group. And so if you saw it, just the back of this skull and you didn't see the rest of this, you would know right away that where these guys belong. And you can see here, right, that this guy doesn't have any teeth up front. So this follows that less than or equal to five teeth in the front. Now, the group that we're going to deal with specifically today are the margin of cephaly, or the margin of cephal cephalia. Uh, these are uh, members that have large shields or head components. They, the way that we define that biologically is that they have a narrow parietal shelf obscuring occipital elements in the dorsal view. So this is a dorsal view here. And when, you see, when we're talking about narrow parietal shelf, it means a, an actual shelf of bone which covers up the eye uh, occipital orbit when you look down on top of it. And so that's what you're seeing here. You won't see it as much here, but it sticks up right above, right? So that's what's blocking the view. The lateral portions of these shells uh, are, form it, uh, are formed by the squamosal bone. So these are uh, a head bone that expands out and helps to cover up that eye. Again, this is in your books. 
It's important uh, in the sense that it gives us uh, location about where these animals are, are and how they actually are, are separated from one another. Uh, but let's move on to, to stuff about their uh, distribution in ecology, which I think is more interesting. Oh, yep, I just showed it to you there with the, the arrows. So the distribution that we know of today, uh, based on the finds that we have, is that these are either found in North America or they're found in Asia, and the older groups are primarily found in Asia. Are we going to find any other groups elsewhere? No or yes? How many say no? How many say yes? Probably it's no, uh, probably because this group evolved in Laurasia as opposed to Gondwanalan. But we do have to be careful because the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because we find them in two places doesn't mean that we uh, understand their phylogeny perfectly. It's possible that they exist elsewhere. For the moment, though, these are a Laurasian group. So they belong to our uh, sort of supercontinent um, of Asia and North America. And that seems relatively secure, but there is a lot of debate about how that, that those actually interact with each other. In Asia, anyway, when we find them, we find them in relatively um, uh, desert-like environments. They're, they're arid regions that probably flooded once a year, became relatively lush during that period of time where, where uh, rains were falling, and then would dry back out uh, during a long, prolonged dry season. Again, a, a monsoonal-type uh, seasonality. And so the skeletons from Asia we actually have are, are decent. They actually uh, include uh, articulated bones uh, and, and near-hole skeletons. Compare that to North America, we're going to tend to find them on the coastal plains. They're often, often going to be fossils that have been washed downstream, so they will be highly weathered. And that appears to be because they are living in very, very mountainous environments. Again, that is actually not di terribly different from an arid environment. Uh, those are probably similar in many ways. They're relatively dry, they're highly seasonal, um, and the, the amount of other animals there uh, can be uh, pretty low, right? So you can have relatively few animals, but these animals are persist. That does lead to some very interesting comparisons, right? Are they very similar to things like mountain goats, right? Which actually behave, we think, if the skulls are used for impact uh, in a very similar manner in a contestion of strength, right? So there's some very interesting comparisons you might be able to make there. So you, the one of the ways we might say, okay, where, where else what might we find them? Well, this is, this is the Earth, uh, surface of the Earth at about the stage of the Middle Jurassic. One thing to note here is that uh, North America is still probably connected uh, to some degree to South America and therefore the rest of Gondwanalam. But Asia has already split away, and what's, what's occurring now is that intermittently maybe animals are able to cross occasionally. If, if islands are exposed, uh, if animals are able to swim short, short distances, uh, if there are, for smaller animals, it's probably if they get rafted to other places, right, if they're on a raft of material that gets washed somewhere. For a large animal like a, a um, dinosaur on the order of the size of a man, washing to another location is not going to happen. But short distance swims may be possible depending on where you are. In any case, uh, what will happen by the close of the Jurassic is that North America will be fully removed. Gondwana land will go off and do its own thing for the rest of evolutionary time, uh, until modern day, I should say and North America and Asia will intermittently connect, disconnect, 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 depending on sea levels and that kind of stuff. So this is what these animals, are, in the Asian area, they're just going to be on a, a nice big flat continental crust. In the uh, North American region, they're actually going to be associated with the formation of the Rockies. So these guys will arrive as the Rockies are forming and they will live in those environments. They're going to live in mountainous regions. And it's because there is lots of material uh, dragged underneath our continental plate which is being uh, pushed up to the surface as the Rockies are forming and also because the plates are being squished. Okay, so for feeding wise, uh, these guys have relatively few and they have peg-like teeth. Now these are probably, uh, if you look into the skull here, what you'll see is that the teeth are aligned all along that jaw uh, and there are relatively numerous of them. So if you compare that to things like Ankylosaurus or Stegosaurus, you will see that there are far more teeth in the skull. The teeth are triangular again, that's characteristic of this group, right, of the ornith ornithischians, you're going to have triangular teeth, so that shouldn't be terribly uh, surprising. 
They've also got um, some other stuff like these small Ramphorica. But these, they also have, a, not dissimilar again from the Ankylosaurus uh, situation, they have a hugely expanded rib cage, And that's probably almost certainly to accommodate some differentiation within the gut. So these guys are, are certainly uh, functioning as uh, herbivores and relatively efficient herbivores in the sense that they're acquiring plant material, chewing it up, and then swallowing it and working on it in the gut. Uh, so they are, in this way, not confusing like we had with the Stegosaurus and the Ankylosaurus, where there was real confusion about if they are chewing, how are they doing it? And if they aren't chewing, why do they look like they should be chewing, right? This is that expanded gut, that rib cage, right? It's very, very obvious from the dorsal view. These are the hips in here, right? And you can see that those ribs extend well, well outside uh, of the body. I do want you just to keep in mind what the skeleton looks like right here because as we're talking about headbutting stuff, I want you to remember that uh, they have these very large expanded rib cages. I'm gonna come back to that briefly at least. You'll notice also very similar to many ornithischians, they have this very uh, elongate tail, but it's also reinforced with those um, ossified tendons. So the tail is now straightened and tightened along the body. So there's not a lot. These are not whip-like tails that will, will whip out and then come back. These are tails that are gonna pivot from a point and largely just swing to provide balance when the animal's moving quickly. So these are going to be probably relatively fast bipeds. I don't, I didn't find any information that we have trackways on them, but I suspect you're dealing with animals that are not as fast as things as ostriches, but still relatively fast. They would probably easily outpace a man. So you're probably talking of a 25 mile per hour uh, just based on uh, uh, the way that their body is set up. But if we get trackways, it would be interesting to compare. Ostriches, by comparison, are much, much faster. They're doing like 40, 45 miles per hour, but they're really built for speed. For the food, anyway, these animals are not particularly large, probably on the order of uh, a small child to a large man is probably where they're standing at the hip height. Remember, with dinosaurs, it's a little unusual when I say man size because there's an enormous tail that comes off the back of them. So when I talk about size, what I'm really talking about is uh, uh, roughly where the head is located or in some cases where the hip is located. So these guys are probably standing uh, at about low to mid height. As a result, they're probably browsing on a number of different things. They're accessing things on the ground uh, probably occasionally. And then they can also access uh, materials up uh, probably at where we would say is about uh, shoulder height or about head height, right? And they may be able to grasp and, and collect that material. And when we see these uh, images of these guys, you'll also see that they have little little arms, but they're still fairly well-developed arms, and they have five fingers. So they may be able to manipulate things in front of them. Uh, at least they have arms that are, are relatively robust to that degree. <coughs> like I said before, the skull does suggest some uh, elements of mastication. We've got relatively numerous teeth. Uh, these guys have those teeth set up so that they have a chewing component and a, and a nipping component. They have... Um, uh, uh, they have uh, well inset cheeks, uh, right? So they can provide that kind of material. And then they have an elongated gut, um, probably to provide use of, of all that plant material. Probably based on their skulls, they are probably selecting certain materials as opposed to generally browsing things. And that's based on the width of the snout. Snouts that are very narrow, they, they don't have the narrowest of snouts, but they do have no narrow snouts to some degree are probably uh, evolved to pick material as opposed to uh, wide snouts, which of course would just allow you to capture everything that's in front of you. So they're probably picking some types of plant material. This would be very interesting to look at if we had lots of articulated skeletons uh, that preserve um, uh, uh, the soft tissue as well, but those are relatively rare, so we don't get those very often. Later in the course, we are gonna talk about ornithischians for which we do have soft material preserved in place and we do actually have gut content. So we can compare what they're eating with what we know is in the environment and see what they're actually feeding on. That will come later, so I'm, I'm gonna tease you with that now, but that will come later. And those are very interesting questions. So what do they eat, right? If you have, if you have lots of chewing power. For these guys, uh, brain-wise, brain these are uh, middle of the road for plant eaters, which makes them relatively stupid compared to carnivores, which shouldn't be surprising. Hunting down and capturing plants is a relatively low energy investment job in the sense of intelligence. It does require some amount of intelligence. You have to differentiate poisonous plants, and you, have, you should probably learn where certain plants are located, but that amount of learning is not very much, uh, relatively speaking. 
So these are probably uh, not, they're not super smart, they're not super stupid uh, in the form of ornithischians, but if you compare them to something like a modern bird that can be relatively intelligent, you might be surprised that they're, they're not very smart in that way. They do appear to have large olfactory lobes, and that may be related to, again, that selective feeding. Uh, that's probably a component of, again, animals, animals choosing something from the environment, or in the case of an animal in a very arid environment, it may be very useful to, to seek out plant food uh, by learning to smell uh, or, or to find very localized sources of that material. Interestingly, the brain in the adults of these animals is ro lo rotated down such that the lobe actually sits as if someone had bent it downwards. So it, it, the brain actually rotates down, and that will be very important when we see about how the head is actually held in a normal mode within the body. So that will tend to hold the head um, at a 90 degree angle to the spine, as opposed to most dinosaurs which hold a nice S-shaped neck. Uh, and those, those heads are very different in that way. We're also going to see things like increases in the dome um, as the height increases, so as the animal ages, and then uh, we're going to talk about why the occipital needs to move. So the occipital, again, is that bone that's going to allow the, the brain to exit through the back of the skull. Okay, so here is, here's the occipital bone here in a human, right? And then the humans are very, also very, very unusual uh, because humans, again, evolve from an animal that is quadrupedal. And so unlike a quadruped, which tends to want to bring its neck forward so that the back can be out, so that the, the rear legs can be behind it, humans actually want to bring the head up so that the legs sit perfectly underneath the brain, right, so that the weight comes down through the body. That's not particularly surprising to you uh, as a human. It doesn't look unusual, but I will promise you if you look at a lot of vertebrates, this location of this, uh, the, the foramen magnum, which is where the, the spinal cord comes up into the skull, is very unusual. So the occipital is a very unusual occipital relative to many other groups of mammals. Again, relative to, to quadrupeds, which tend to move it out towards the back of the skull. Oh, here I see the occipital. These guys are also going to do uh, a movement of that uh, occipital. The reasoning for that, right, is very obvious if you want to smash heads together, right? If you want heads to collide, then what you want to actually do is position your head in a very distinct pattern. And that distinct pattern will be really important for making sure that you don't kill yourself when you run into somebody else. Because you may have to run into somebody else a lot, and you want to make sure that you don't just happen to kill, break your own neck uh, and them to get all the prize, which may be a mating opportunity. I will warn you that we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about whether uh, they headbutted. Uh, whether that's actually what the skull was used for or, what, or how they might have done it, right? I've shown you a lot of options here. There's this, there's, uh, some people have argued it's something like what's called a lock and shove. So the animals align their heads and then they push backwards and forwards on top of each other. There is this straight up headbutt, which you are familiar with if you've ever seen large mammals fight with horns. They actually do line up and smash into each other. Uh, and then there's also this is the flank butting uh, which goats do. Uh, and then we, that is also a possibility, right? And again, the other possibility which we're going to discuss is that they're not used for contests of strength. They are still useful for sexual selection, but they don't, they're not used as weapons in that case. And in all of these cases, we're not going to discuss the option that they're used against predators. And that, I've not seen anyone forward that idea, and I suspect that's because there's, there's not a lot of evidence in modern animals. Modern animals that, that use headbutting as, a, as a, uh, a contestant of strength do not primarily defend themselves with that, right? So you could have, the, the possibility of using it also as a tool is there, uh, but we don't see that in a lot of modern groups, and so we don't anticipate that, uh, and also uh, it, it would be very hard to test. So it's not that we throw it out. These are the best possible guesses we have right now that are most easily testable, but a tool is not out of the question. It is possible to imagine an animal using a, a head to do things like break vegetation, right? That's certainly a, an opportunity. Yeah, and this is how we do it. We come up with ideas, whether they seem crazy or not, and we need to go out and test them. And sometimes the ideas that are hard to test are the best ideas because they are the ones that, that we find to be best supported, but sometimes they're not, and, and science goes about uh, doing the best it can. 
we are going to look at some evidence to suggest that they are, uh, again, both for headbutting and for sexual display, but the idea of, of using them for something else is certainly out there. Oh, okay, so let's look at, let me do two things here. Let me pause. So this is, this is the best way to use bone. Bone fibers are oriented in columns. If you ever look at them under a microscope, they look exactly like columns. There's a centerpiece and there's cells that go all the way around it. And they form literally circular columns within the bone. Columns are extremely, extremely strong to compressive forces. So bones are very difficult. In fact, they're harder to, to break by compression than concrete is. It is very difficult to break bone uh, when you're in line with these columnar, uh, columnar uh, structures within the bone. Bones, however, because they are very resistant to compressive forces, they are very, very weak um, to twisting forces. To be strong against compressive forces, you want structures that are stable and won't move, so that when you push on the ends, they won't shift next to each other. If you want to be strong to twisting forces, you want the opposite of that. You want to be relatively flexible so that when something is twisted, mo things move out of place and then can return to place after the force leaves it. So bones are very strong to compressive forces, which is not a bad thing if we're going to deal with animals running into each other, but they're extremely dense as a result of that and so become very, very weak to twisting forces. So things that cause lateral motions of the head are very, very dangerous uh, for animals that run into one another because that will cause a neck to snap almost immediately. It almost doesn't matter how much muscle you put onto it. Uh, if you have large animals running into each other, you can easily break the neck. So muscles, in a, comp in a way, are the, the counter to bones. Bones provide compressive forces, so they or protect you against compressive forces. Muscles tend to provide protection against lateral twisting. And when you do both, uh, when you manage to, to uh, break one or the other, then you can have things like uh, uh, bones fractures. So athletes who build up muscles to very, very high levels, actually build them up to the point where they're, they're so much stronger uh, than the bones that they can actually pull on the bones in very unusual ways and snap them. And they, they make them very weak as a result of that. That's why if you do athletic training, you should do lots of different kinds of training so that all of your muscles are built up relatively evenly. And that will tend to strengthen your bones as well because your bones will become more dense to meet those muscle demands. But it is also why athletes can have really damaging injuries, right? When it gets bad, it gets really bad because the amount of forces that are involved are so much higher that they can really damage themselves. Okay, uh, anyway, the bone fibers that are oriented in columns are really useful uh, for orienting forces away from things. So if you want to tr have forces travel down these columns, that's very easy to do. That's what we do whenever we build buildings, right? They, they put the force from the top to the bottom. So they get the, the weight of the building, for instance, all the way to the ground, and at that point you're fine. This is also going to be important for us if we're going to talk about animals that are going to do headbutting because we want to get the forces that are being applied to the head around the brain. We do not want, it doesn't matter if you're stupid or if you're really smart in the animal kingdom. Brains are really sensitive and you can do a lot of damage to yourself just by a little bit of contact with the brain. Even very what we call stupid animals still have to use their brains and those brains exist for a reason. They provide functionality in that sense. So we can't just go, well, they're stupid, so they don't need brains. <coughs> That's not true. They need smaller brains, which is why they have them. And they have a more limited repertoire of uh, activities as a result of that. But it doesn't mean that they don't need brain power. So this is, this is one of the, the papers that I was reading for this course. Uh, and this I really like because it's, it's a diagram of a, a through the skull. So here's the skull of the pachyosaur right here. And this dotted area shows you where the cut comes out of. And what you can see is that in this skull especially, uh, that there are very distinct sections to these bones, right? These are not homogeneous structures throughout. That shouldn't be terribly surprising. There are some issues uh, for us to understand. One is we have relatively dense bone, but not the densest bone on the outside. We have lots of spongy bone underneath. And then we have really dense bone underneath that. And that causes a lot of issues. Uh, if you have really highly compressive bone underneath very, very heavy, dense bone above it, when this bone is compressed by forces above, so let's say they're head butting, that will squeeze this bone, right? Because there's now another very, comp a very strong bone underneath it. So it's going to act like a sandwich. And that means that this will be squeezed out like a sponge every time you compress. You don't want that. That is not the way you want to head butt because that will damage uh, blood vessels. 
that will damage any nerves that are there, that will damage cells that are there. It'll basically, uh, it'll basically chew up the cells in there, right? It'll act like a blender because it'll go back and forth and back and forth and these forces will basically destroy all the cells that are within there. So this structure here is not a particularly great structure to have if you want to do lots of headbutting. So why do we find it in Pachyosaurus? And one of the arguments that Goodwin and Homer actually, or uh, Horner, sorry, Goodwin and Horner made in 2004 was that these structures are not primarily for headbutting. They probably aren't used for headbutting. And there's been a lot of debate about that within the literature, whether that's actually the case or not. So here is their, uh, here's their paper that I drew that image from. And you will see here that they argue that the structures in these heads of the pachyosaurs are inconsistent with headbutting behavior. They do agree that they're very strong indicators of sexual selection uh, because these structures are relatively large, they're relatively complex, and there appear at least to be in some cases differentiation between what may be sexes, so we're going to talk about that in a bit as well. But they, do, they, they argue that they are inconsistent with headbutting. And at the time in 2004, I think that they had a relatively strong argument in that sense. So a lot of other people became very interested in finding out uh, is this in fact the case? This is a more recent paper. This came out in 2013. And this paper looked at what are called cranial pathologies. Cranial pathologies are damages or, or structural elements of bone um, and the, the uh, diseases that are associated with them or the damages to them. And one of the things that you can look for uh, in fossils, right, is you can look for the ways that fossil bones uh, may have been treated in their life. So these are, uh, these are mammals, obviously, these are not fossils, but these are animals that ram regularly. And what you can see here is that a, a common pathology for these skulls, for animals that ram, is that they actually break and damage the bones of the skull. And when they do that, sometimes they get infected, uh, and as a result, they can have holes in them. And they have very distinct holes, the bacteria infect these areas. Uh, the bones can also break and not set quite right, and then they're sort of out of alignment. But in any case, you'll have areas that are clearly uh, one time of growth, right? You have a growth that occurred at some point. Then you had some sort of break or weakness that occurred within that bone, and then growth occurred again around that point. So these are very distinct uh, holes. So let's look at uh, the skulls of these guys in action. Okay, so these are, uh, these are classic examples of uh, skull pathologies in these animals. So then the next obvious question you would ask is, do we see them? Well, they argue very strongly, in fact, you can find them, right? These are very, very obviously found here, right? Here's a giant hole. Look at the size of these holes in these animal skulls, right? These are not from uh, after the fossil or during fossil, uh, fossilization that these were lost. These are actually components of the bone, and if you look at them in CT scans, which is what they do in this paper, uh, what you find uh, is that these, uh, these bony elements had some regrowth around them. So there is actually bone attempting to regrow around them. You can see that here, right? There's lots of them. Uh, th some of these animals have very, very large openings, so they, they must have taken a lot of damage to the skull at some point. Uh, and then the other thing that they're going to talk about in their paper is that the, uh, the location of these are very important. You'll also notice here that we have lots of just the domes. And this is because we're dealing a lot with these North American animals. The North American animals, again, we don't have really good fossils from. They probably lived in mountainous regions. Mountains are some of the worst places to form fossils. There's mostly erosion, not much deposition. So probably these animals were living in mountains. Their skulls or bodies might wash downstream uh, at some point, and if we're lucky at that point, they get buried and then turn into fossils. But they're probably not being buried in the location where they're actually found, so you have a lot more weathering occurring before we get access to these fossils in that case. The other thing that they looked at here uh, is they looked at the orientation of the skull relative to that occipital and that, that big uh, opening in the bottom of the skull to let the, nerve, the, the big nerve bundle out right to the spinal cord. And what you can see is, so these animals in panel A are what we think are juveniles. Uh, and what you can see is that their domes do align, but they have this weird thing where they tuck their snouts in almost up to their chest. So these, their snouts are clearly tucked in at an angle relative to the skull. That is not an ideal position to be in to get to 90 degrees. It rotates the head way far down, and the eyes would be very difficult. They would have a really hard time seeing, right, because your eyes rotated so far into your body. Compare that to what we think is probably an adult, maybe a male, 
Uh, and what you can see is that the eyes are aligned and also that the heads meet at 90 degrees and look, there's, this is where the spine would be, right? And so you have these very nice straight lines that would provide lots of weight distribution away from that skull, right? So there's, there's the opportunity there at least. Now these are a little bit unusual. The mammals I showed you had very, very flat areas where they could contact, right? Those musk ox had that really nice flat uh, dome on top of their head. Um, and the, the rams actually, the, the horns sort of fit next to each other to prevent you from sliding side to side, right? Because if you hit, you want to make sure that you're, you're aligned perfectly. These animals are a little bit different in that their domes are rounded. So if you come off at a slight angle, you'll tend to glance away from each other. Uh, because if you don't align just right, uh, you're going to be you're going to be at such an angle that the domes will tend to slide past. They also looked at in this paper uh, where they actually found uh, damage. Uh, the white here is partially domed, so they compared partially domed species to these really these obviously large-headed domed species. In all of those cases, what you'll find is that there's a lot of damage to the surface of the skull, not to the most of the other body, and that for the the ones that are fully domed, which are these black dots. They're really concentrated right on top, on the apex of that dome. And that would make a lot of sense for ramming animals, right? That they should have histologies that represent uh, animals that hit each other in the head, so they should have damages to the bones. They should be located right on top of the structure. Uh, and they should, also, uh, they should also have structures such that their heads look like they're associated with that. So things like the occipital should be rot rotated and the bones should be really nice and dense. And there should be real differences between the juveniles because they're not going to need to pay for these big expensive skulls and adults. And we think we do have those, right? So there appear to be very distinct uh, growth stages within these guys. I did mention this before. The problem for heads, at least, is that there's lots of soft material in there that you'd like to not damage, including things like the eyes. So not just the brain, but also the eyes. And then, of course, that, uh, we're more familiar now with things like concussions, but concussions can happen to any animal as long as the brain can move within that skull. So it's, those are relatively threatening injuries. If you can imagine, humans uh, that suffer concussions can have long-term effects, right? They can also be uh, incapacitated on the order of days sometimes to weeks. If you're an animal and you run into a, a competitor and you get a concussion and then cannot move for a couple of days, that's basi basically death. Uh, you will you will probably die at that point. So concussions and those sort of things are very dangerous for animals. The other thing that's really dangerous for headbutting reasons, and this is this is another concern, is that there are lots of really strong stresses on the neck, uh, and that's another place you don't really want to put a lot of stress because the neck protects the spinal cord right as it enters into the body. So it'd be really nice not to have the neck. And unfortunately for us, the neck is designed to allow the head to move side to side, but that's exactly the sort of movement you don't want to have. So you have these competing interests within the head. And of course, um, any sublethal hit to the head, even if it's just a fractured bone, can often be death. Uh, and that's especially true as bones get really, really thick, because if you get a little bit of bacteria inside of them, right, they can really grow inside of that and cause bone rot, and you can actually die from that. And so uh, small fractures in large skulls are not good. You don't want that in either way. So again, if, if these guys are actually headbutting, we should see some modifications of the body. Well, one of the things, again, is that that brain appears very, very strongly rotated to provide access to the, the spine uh, at a 90 degree angle when the head is lowered. So we do see that. We do see, uh, at least we have some evidence that there's a lot more musculature in the neck of these guys relative to other dinosaur groups. So these appear relatively strong necks, which again makes sense. And necks are going to prevent twisting side to side. And then uh, the other thing that we see, at least in some of the vertebrae, uh, we don't have a lot, again, because in North America where this is the most well-developed uh, component of these guys where they have the biggest skull caps, uh, we don't have uh, very many neck vertebrae. But where we do have them, they appear to lock into each other. So they actually have uh, teeth that sit out. And when they, when they uh, are in, in the live animal, they would have overlapped and prevent the vertebrae from actually turning side to side. So they may have had relatively stiff necks um, to speak of. So that would all suggest that, yes, indeed, there is something going on where there's a lot of forces directed down the back. But I do want to warn you that our knowledge of these guys is relatively incomplete. We have a long way to go, partially, again, because we have so few fossils. Here's one. This is a genus that was named, uh, a pachyosaurus that was named uh, from this fragment, which they assumed was a skull bone. That turned out to be correct. It turned out to actually be a theropod uh, 
uh, skull. It was actually this bone right here in front, uh, right up above the nares, right? So this is actually this conglomerate of bones right here was actually considered a species of pachysaur. Very distinctly, that is not the case. But that should give you an idea of how hard it, it can be to, to figure out these bones. We just don't have a lot. And the articulated skeletons that we would want, the really big North American families, we don't have. And we probably won't get them. It's probably very unlikely that we'll run into them. Incidentally, this is not dissimilar from the problem we have with the evolution of bats. Bats appear to have evolved in forested cave-like areas. And forested caves are like literally the worst place um, to have a fossil. Caves are not going to produce fossils, and any animals that die in the forest are going to be eaten immediately. And so we just have bat fossils, relatively speaking, extremely rare. We could lay out um, in this little section of the table, we could lay out every fossil bat that we have ever collected. So there just aren't very many, and that's a similar problem we have here. There are also uh, strong indicators that these are social structures. So in some groups where we do have a, a relatively large number of skull caps, there appears to be a very strong one-to-one -one ratio between what are considered the, the small caps and the large caps. The large caps are these guys down at the bottom, you know, very, very large and relatively thick, versus the small caps, which are still thick, and these are pretty impressive skulls nonetheless, but they are probably... Uh, uh, probably, they are thinner and probably less useful if you're doing impact stuff. Which, which one of these is probably going to be males or females? Okay, so you think that the males will have the larger one. Why would males have larger? Um, because they are competing <coughs> against each other to, to, uh, for the female. Sure. So that's what mammals do? Okay. Sure. Th sexual selection to a T. Absolutely. What other? Well, are there any other patterns that we see? Could it be the other way around? Are there any birds that have ma females that compete for males? Yeah. Okay. So that does leave us with a bit of a conundrum here because obviously birds are closely related. So in a characteristic mammal sense. Uh, males are almost always going to compete for females because uterus space is very, very limited all the time. You just don't have very much of it, and so you really want to fight for it. Birds, on the other hand, are going to be able to do something else, which is while eggs may be limited, um, they can do things like lay eggs and leave, right? And so that can create a different dynamic where males are required to sit and protect the eggs if they think that they've uh, fertilized them, whereas a female may be better off saying, uh, I, I'm just going to abandon the nest and go get more energy reserves and try to breed with another male. And so actually birds can sometimes uh, have reverse roles as well, where m females actually compete for males and males uh, do not compete for females. So they are considered the limiting sex in that way. So for these guys, I would probably agree with you. My guess is that males have thicker skulls. Until we get good evidence that that's the case, and it may happen at some point if we can get a thin-skulled animal with um, uh, certain types of, with medullary bone, which is associated with growing bird uh, and eggshells, then we would know right away that's a female and that, that probably they are, they are, males are competing. If you see it the other way, though, you shouldn't be surprised. You would just assume that females then compete uh, and are probably more migratory in that way. So this is, uh, this is, these animals are sort of an enigma um, in some ways. They are very, very cool animals. Uh, their skulls are very clearly designed for social interactions to some degree. How exactly that social interaction occurred, it's currently we suspect it's head-on-head -head collision, right? If we, uh, if we found lateral hits or, or head pushing, we would expect different pathologies, but they look very much like animals that ran today. Uh, and they're, they're this dome does clearly grow uh, differently between juveniles and adults. So juvenile skulls are very, very different. I'm going to show you that in just a second as well. There also appears to be some sexual selection or sexual differentiation. So there appears to be at least a one-to-one -one ratio, which suggests males to females of some kind. Uh, and that, that also suggests that this has some role in sexual selection. Just so you know, in, in life, these animals are probably, uh, this area is probably covered with keratin. There are blood vessels on the outside of the bone. And so this, the, the outside of that skull cap would be covered in the same material that makes up your fingernails. And again, that probably provides a small cushion between the bone and the other bone if it's hitting it. 
and it also provides a protective layer so that the bone underneath can grow and be protected from external things and the keratin on top can be replaced easily if there's, if there's some damage to those. Okay, so there's actually, this is another Horner uh, paper. He pointed out that uh, a lot of the pachysaurs we have are found in the same place as other members. They are only ever found as juveniles and they have very, very small skull caps. And so he proposed that this species, Dracorex, is actually uh, a juvenile of Pachycephalosaurus because we have no adult Dracorex. And when you look at the characteristics that define Dracorex, they are uh, transitory to Pachycephalosaurus. So there's no clear break between them. The only differences really are related to the size of the skull cap and the orientation of the, there are a lot of little tiny sticky bones that come out of the back of that, which would have made a kind of cool thrill on the back of these guys. And those are largely gone. They become just uh, uh, either they are lost or they become very small bone knobs on the back of this pachycephal. So at least for uh, juveniles, we have some indication that indeed, if there is some sexual selection, animals are born without skull caps, as you would expect, because they don't need them. They're not going to be competing over mates yet. And then they probably attain them later in life as they begin to enter into the adult population, the subadult population, and begin to compete for animals. And the, the reasoning for that, right, is what we call an honest signal. So an animal that is attempting to display its sexual fitness or its fitness in general needs to convince a partner that, in fact, that you are fit. And you have to do that with an honest signal, that it can't be, it can't be a signal you can fudge. So if I could tell you I'm very, very fit but be loaded with parasites, then that wouldn't be an honest signal. But if you ask me for a signal that proves that I have to not have parasites, and birds do this in things like certain feather colors, that parasites use certain molecules, and as a result, certain, par uh, certain colors are very difficult to express when you have a high parasite load, then you end up with what's called an honest signal. So if you have a high parasite load, you can't produce the reddest f feathers. And if you can't produce red feathers, then the other member knows, no matter what you tell them, you have a high parasite load, and therefore your fitness is relatively low. And that is what these skulls may be. It's a very expensive thing. The skull is very expensive. Combat may be very expensive if it occurred. And if you are in combat and you get damaged, you can't get around that. You're just going to have to suffer those damages. And so as a result, that tells the other thing, honestly, you're very fit because you're able to survive damages to these things. So very clearly, the skulls are getting damaged. Why or why not? That may, that's something else. But it does at least uh, behoove the other members of the society that they can know that animal is very, very fit. It's able to survive lots of damages to its skull, and therefore that becomes an honest signal because I can't lie to you about it. And it has to be truthful in that way. All right, so next lecture, we're going to talk about another group of really thrilled dinosaurs. And these, these are also very cool animals. And we're also going to talk about uh, the social implications for these frills and whether they engaged in combat with each other. So I want you to keep in mind, again, remember where those pathologies were located. They were on the top of that skull, right very center to it. We're going to look at the pathologies on these guys as well and see where they're located to try to discern a little bit about uh, how they may have used their horns, right? So it should be very different between groups and it should be very different depending on whether they're using them primarily for defense or primarily for uh, uh, animal-to-animal contact, so interspecific contact.